Good morning. Welcome to our worship service today. It is the second Sunday in January, and I am so glad we have the Lord to hold on to. Um, before I move into a word, and God has a word today, and it's something how this word from the Lord actually corresponds with what we're seeing today, what we've seen happen. I'm, of course, referring to the incident that took place in our nation's capital that has rocked our country. Those of us who have been watching the antics of our president, I don't mean any disrespect, we were not shocked, although um, we, we, we kind of expected it. Um, we weren't surprised. Well, let me get into the message, so let me get into my response, and then I'll move into the message. Today, my heart is saddened by the events that took place in our nation's capital, where the domestic terrorists exposed the culminating effect of having a president who is supposed to be a leader of this country who has total disregard for anyone but himself. There's only one word to describe what took place, and that is unadulterated evil. This was not an expression of anger that their candidate did not get elected. This was not the ugliness that we learned to see through partisan politics. It was not even just a disregard for the sanctity and sacredness of our democracy. This was a satanically motivated evil. From the perspective of a black American who is also a Christian, the leniency and excuse making that I have heard from some of the larger news outlets once again exposes the explaining away of racial implications of white privilege and entitlement. The systemic tolerance of these the systemic tolerance of these rioters spoke loudly to all African Americans that the long-standing acts of legalized discrimination, judicial and social inequities, and the political and racial disenfranchisement has been so normalized that not even an event of this magnitude could make people see it. Those of us who are black and brown people, we wanted you to know we've been living in two Americas where it always seems we come up on the short end of justice. I concur with everyone else, had that been people of color climbing and, and uh, breaking windows and running and just, and just disrespecting our capital, that we would be removing body bags right now. As a matter of fact, there would be a strong outcry of justification for why they shot the perpetrators. Anyone who does that kind of act should be shot. But isn't it funny? It seems like justice seems only to be rushed to when they're talking about people of color. I'm calling all saints of God to pray. I'm calling all my evangelical brothers and sisters who have overlooked the pettiness, the name calling, the immoral acts, the igniting of racial divisions, and the uncountable lies because our president lacks the ability to take accountability for anything he has done. I'm calling on you to say enough is enough. No more enabling. No more supporting in spite of. Somehow saying his party is the Christian party because of abortion rights and pro-life judges that he was able to place on the bench. There are more ways to be baby killers and people killers than just through abortion. What about ignoring the cries of justice and equality for people who have long been under persecution in our country? Please understand, we are the light of the world talking about the church. And we have been commanded to let our light shine. Our great pray and watch God restore, revitalize, and correct the injustices and bring our country back to a place of human decency. We need racial 
and economic reconciliation. Please pray for our incoming President's administration, President-elect Joe Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Pray that God will give them the wisdom as they set about to once again unify America, reestablish our democracy, and make us once again the beacon of freedom all around this free world. Please pray with me that prayer as we move from this, from chaos to calm, as we trust in our God. God bless you. I need you to grab your Bibles and go with me today to our text. You do not want to move. You do not want to miss this. God is speaking loudly into what is happening in our country. I, I, I always marvel someone says that God knows. Well, it's also, uh, I, I guess I've gotten used to it through the anointing of God, how God knows just what to give us. So I want you to watch this. Go to 1 John chapter 4. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I'm beginning reading at the first verse. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but prove the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that cometh and now is already in the world. Ye are of God, my little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Prayerfully this morning. Can you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, please allow your anointing to come down. Lord, settle my mind, settle my spirit. Touch your people all over. Those who have joined in today to hear this word. Refresh them, Lord. Reestablish your dominancy. Reestablish that you are Lord. Your Lordship over our life. God, right now, I surrender the service into your hands. Speak, Lord. Even through this technology, let your anointing be felt. In Jesus' name, amen. For the Spirit of the Lord will allow, I'm going to speak from this thought. Follow me quickly. Hey, that's the wrong spirit. Can I do it again? Hey, that is the wrong spirit. We are reading 1 John chapter 4. And I need you to know that the Apostle John was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, his mother, his mother was Salome, his father was Zebedee, and they were, and his brother James was also a disciple of Jesus Christ, and they were given the name Bojanerges by Jesus, which means sons of thunder. We also recognize that John was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that may be kind of confusing because Jesus loved all his disciples. But John was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And if you go back to John's Gospel, chapter 20, his account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you'll find these words in the second chapter. Mary Magdalene had run to the tomb, and when she got there, she saw the stone was rolled away, and Jesus' body was gone. So the second verse of the 20th chapter says, She ran, and she ran into Peter and that other disciple whom Jesus loved. Loved, And she said, I don't know where Jesus' body is going. I don't know where they've taken him. Jesus loved them all, but John had this special place in Jesus' life. What do I mean by that? He was the youngest of the apostles. He outlived the rest of them. He died a natural death because he fought many spiritual battles. Uh, matter of fact, he was so in tune with God that he received the apocalyptic revelation, which we call the book of Revelation, when he was on the Isle of Patmos because he was close enough to God for God to pour that revelation into his spirit. And as we think about what John did there, he actually was able to give us the, the study of eschatology, where we study the end times. We only know about Jesus coming because God whispered it 
into the ear of the Apostle John. We find out how tough he is because he had many names that show us his faith and his wisdom. He was called John of Patmos, and that means something significant, I'll tell you. He was called John the Elder. He was called John the Evangelist. And, of course, the beloved disciple. And we find out that he wrote in 1 John this same book, the 5th chapter, the 4th verse, maybe because of his experiences, the same experiences you and I need to have today. Because of his experience, he was able to say that we are overcomers. Because 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says this. It says, that which is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the faith. That he, this is what overcomes the world, even our faith. I believe... That John was saying, I'm an overcomer. You can become an overcomer because you've been born by God. It was church historian Tertullian who actually gave us some extra biblical information. We find out, he recounts the story, that when the Roman authorities tried to kill John, he was just hard to kill. Matter of fact, there was one story that is related to church history that they put John in boiling oil. But somehow he escaped. I don't know how he did it. I know he was on God's side. How many of you know? I don't know how God gets us out of what he gets us out of. But some of us can celebrate. He wasn't born alone, but it was some bad stuff. The Lord was able to deliver us from. And we find out that John was able to let us know through his experiences on the Isle of Patmos because they had to remit him to the Isle of Patmos because they could not kill him. I believe they couldn't kill him because God wasn't done with him. That's a shouting point for somebody right there. God, the enemy can't kill you until God is done with you. Today we have the distinct pleasure of looking into one of the most powerful books in the Bible. It is the book of 1 John, written from the heart of a warrior, somebody who was able to overcome, somebody who was not martyred, somebody who made it through and gave us quality. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation was written by this apostle. He gave us quality books. As a matter of fact, in Second John, just so you know that he wrote books that tell us that we need to have a continual walk of power and quality of life to our life. What he's saying is you left 2020 and you're here because in the book of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he was writing to the churches of Asia Minor, and there there were false prophets going from house to house. You do know that the churches back then were house churches, and as he was going from house to house, these uh, false prophets were spreading sedition and heresy and bringing up popular interpretations of Scripture, but it wasn't the true interpretation of Scripture. So John had to write against it to say, you got to put down those kind of spirits. Let me tell you what he did. Second John was written to the elect lady. And in that book it says that he was writing it because some deceivers had come along to deceive us. Some of us have been deceived because it sounds good to the ear, tickle our ear, but it's not what God said. In 3 John, he wrote that to Gaius because there was another guy there who was talking about John and trying to bring trouble into the church. But in 1 John, the book that we're looking at, we find out that is where the real quality of life comes from. In because that's where I pick up my message. Watch this. In 1 John, he wanted us to know about having a relationship with God up close and personal. See, I'm mean, going to no time out for this. You know, we know somebody else to lead me to God. I sure like the way they sang. I sure like their prayer. You ought to have a prayer and a relationship for yourself. But it's divided into three parts. Simple outline of this book. Divided into three parts in the five chapters. First, John wants us to know about the light of God. Chapters 1 and 2. He's saying that God's light, light is penetrating. That light that flows through us is why we haven't gone down in the darkness. Secondly, in chapters 3 and 4, he wants us to know about the love of God. And you know the scripture that said, if you can't say you love God, who you never can't say you love your brother who you see every day, how can you say you love God? whom you've never seen. And then the last thing he wanted us to know about the life of God, and that's chapter 5. But we take our text as I hurriedly get there. Listen to me, because this is important. We take it from the fourth chapter of this good book, of this powerful book, 
Because there is a verse there that we have read over, we see it every day, but we have not applied it to how we are living. It is the first verse of that fourth chapter. It says, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see what kind of spirits are running your life. Yep, that's what I said. Watch me. Many of us don't realize when you're coming into 2021, you do not want to have the same contamination, uh, the same spirit capturing you and stealing from you. You don't want the same spirit communicating to you. What I'm saying to you is you got to learn how to check out which spirits you've been following. You got to check out and find out which spirits have been dominating your life. We're going to find out in this text that there are spirits speaking to us. Some of you are happy this morning and you don't even realize a spirit has you oppressed. Some of you can't even walk through your own house because you don't even realize you let a spirit come in that has you oppressed. Your bedroom got spirits in it. Your car, your drive on the way to work got spirits dominating you because spirits begin to speak to our minds. It tries to tell us what to do, how to think, where to go. And the enemy is letting us know there is a battle going on. It's a cosmic battle. It's ongoing. You better hear me. And today I'm telling you, hey, that's the wrong spirit. There is the spirit of God and the spirit of Antichrist. Any spirit that tells you you can't make it, any spirit that says God can't do it, any spirit that says it's over, any spirit that says not this time is not the kind of spirit that you ought to be following and let that spirit actually get into and perpetrate into your spirit so you can't do the things that God wants you. All I'm saying is spirits speak to our mind and they're leading us and sometimes we get blinded because Satan is so strategic that we forget that he's out there battling us every day. This morning, I'm giving you a wake-up call. I'm giving you a warning. That if you walk into 2021 and you don't start testing, <laughs> thank you, God, the spirits run your life, the spirits are going to run you right into the ground. Negative, demanding, dis, uh, uh, tearing down, disabling spirits. Can't even do what God said. And you wonder, some of you, the only reason you have not gotten your dreams, only reason you have not gotten your hopes, only reason you have not realized your desires is because somewhere along the line, you've been allowing the wrong Spirit. Okay, you don't believe me yet? Watch this. The spirits are out to get us. Let's talk about it. I know some people don't like to talk about this because it's spooky, but the devil doesn't want me to expose what he is doing. That's why this message is so important. Somebody say, okay, that's the wrong spirit. Any spirit that's pushing you down is the wrong spirit. Anything tearing you up is the wrong spirit. See, here's what the devil wants to do. Let's, let's talk about it. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Look what he says. There are four levels of demons we have to wrestle with every day. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's one. Powers, rulers of darkness in this world, and spirits of wickedness in high places. Okay? Four levels of demons. I said, wow. And you're sitting there thinking the devil just going to let you have a good life. No. He sends those spirits around. To mess with you. Look at it. Principalities. Powers. Uh, rulers of darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness. All of these spirits are Satan's great army that he sends out every day to tear you and me down so we can't do the things that we need to do. And how he does it? Before he can mess with you, you got to get your attention. And how he gets your attention is he gets into your heart. He gets into your mind. And the devil doesn't play fair. He waits till we're depressed. He waits till we have loss. He waits till we're hurting. And then he jumps on us and sends a spirit in that constantly bombards us until we can't make it. I sometimes you think, oh, man, I must be going crazy. Uh, what's going on? I don't know how. To. And all that is is a spirit trying to trick you out of your inheritance. So the first thing he does, he has this vast army that he sends against you and me every day. The second thing that he does is first, I mean, it's Gospel of John, chapter 10, 10. Same writer. Look what he said. The thief comes. Thief. One of the names for Satan. Adversary. One of the names for Satan. That's what he is. He's our adversary. He is the deceiver. All of those things. It says the thief comes 
not but to kill, steal, and destroy. So the devil not only has four levels of demons he sends out after you every day, he has one plan. And don't you dare forget it. You get lazy and forget it. But the devil said, my one plan is to destroy, steal, kill, destroy your life. He wants to kill your dreams. He wants to destroy your hopes. He wants to make sure you don't have another destiny. He wants to make sure you can't get picked up from your fall when it happens. So that you cannot do what God wants you to do. So the devil is after us. He has a plan of our life. But the worst one of all is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. I love it because in here, he's letting us know that the last thing the devil does is he deceives us. The devil is a deceiver. The ultimate deceiver. You're stronger than you think you are. Because the enemy knows... And if he can put a wrong thought in your head, you won't act on the good thought. You'll act on the wrong thought. And he won't let a thought be that you can cast him out or that you can be healed or you can get out of this. He lets you dwell all night long. Oh, how bad I feel. Then you're crazy enough to start speaking what he put in your mind. I don't know if I'm going to make it. That's oxymoronic for a believer to say it doesn't even matter. I'm, I'm bored. I, I, I don't have any joy. I don't know why I feel so bad all the time. What's going on with me? What's going on with you is the words coming out of your mouth. Because the devil has placed them there so that you will not succeed. Look at the verse. It says, don't marvel that Satan comes as an angel of light. You better hear me. The devil never walks up on you and say, hey, I'm the devil. <laughs> he comes with something appealing, something you want, something you like. You know, he comes because he says, uh, I can get you high, but I can also take you someplace, smoke me. He won't tell you that later you're going to be addicted. He won't tell you, I love you. Come on, lay down with me. I love you. He won't tell you that later on, all you're going to have is a baby daddy. If they were your love, uh, while Satan put the thought in the mind, but the love was motivated by the wrong spirit. Or, I love this one, come on, just lend me the money. I'll pay you back when I get my check. <laughs> yeah. Have you got paid back yet, have you? All I'm saying is they mean well, but they're being led by lying spirits that are tripping them up. I'll never forget the young lady who came to me. Y'all you know, pray for her. She's doing well now. She, she made it through this horrific experience. But she was going to the prison with a church. And while there, doing the will of God, the work of God, there was this one prisoner, you know, made eye contact. One day on the way out illegally, she got a note to him. He got a note to her. And when she got the note, it was his information. She started writing. You know what they said? Just write me. He started writing to him. After they started writing, she began to visit him. Mm, pretty soon, this blossomed into love. He was getting out. The sentence was going to be over pretty soon. So she decided one day she went there, he proposed. And because she listened to the spirit, she married him. Now, I got nothing wrong with somebody marrying somebody in prison. I mean, I don't like it. But, but you got to make sure that you have prayed about it and understand it. But listen to what happened. This guy, while she was there, said, I'm a Christian. He was the epitome of manners. He was always yes, ma'am, and giving her compliments. He looked so nice. Just blew her mind. And that's what the devil does till he got out. When he got out, there was an abrupt change. Laid on the couch, eating food out of the refrigerator. Didn't get up and look for a job. Stole her car when she wouldn't get there. They were married. Stole her car when she wouldn't give it to him. Then, pretty soon, he didn't think about going to church. He told her, I'm reading my Bible at home. Stop reading this Bible. Stop going to church. He said, stop bothering me about it. And after that, the inevitable happened. He hit her. And he told her, I went to prison for murder. Stop. She never even checked out why he was in prison. That's how that spirit can get you. I went to prison for murder, and I murdered one person, I murdered you, you ain't leaving me. Well, she got out. Straining order. She had the courage. It was God that got her out. 
But she said one thing when they asked her what happened. When she was talking about this man, she said, I need y'all to know it wasn't his fault. It was my fault for letting myself be deceived. Come on, that will preach. It's your fault if you sit there with a Bible full of promises and let the devil steal your family. It's your fault if you sit there sick and won't get on your knees and pray. That power that God has is healing power. It is your fault when you're sitting there allowing yourself to go deeper and deeper and deeper down into despair and won't even try to reach up when you got God on your side saying, I'm right here, I'll never leave you. I have enough power to get you through. It's your fault. Now, I don't want to be hard with that, but that's what happens when you allow yourself to be deceived. In this book, this powerful book, uh, John starts off in that first chapter, um, the things which we have heard, which we have seen, which our hands have handled, uh, and our fellowship is with the Father. That, that, uh, first John 1 John 1.1, he says this. He says, um, I want you to know that I want you to fellowship with us because you can have the same kind of fellowship with God. He says get away from sin. Listen to what spirits you're letting in and you can have the fellowship with God. Listen to me. Get away from sin. John said when he started writing in chapter 1 he said get away from sin. You can have the same kind of fellowship. And then in verse 9 he gave us one of the most comforting and what I call the escape root scriptures that we ever had. It's one of the scriptures that is the foundation of our belief system and that is when God saved us Hallelujah, he knew we were going to mess up because he knew we were already messed up. And so what he did was gave us 1 John 1 and 9, still in that first verse. He said he is, he said he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You need to understand something. God knew we were going to mess up. He said, but if you keep pressing for a fellowship, you will be blessed. Okay, let's knock this out. This text is going to teach us three points. The first one is, very simply, test the spirits to see if they're of God. They're in your life, you better test them. Secondly, trust God's spirit and follow it. Trust God's spirit and follow him. Excuse me. And thirdly, tackle each spirit with discernment. Ooh, let's talk about it. Right here, the first thing John says in this first verse, he said, Beloved, believe not, listen, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. The word try there, or test, is the word discernment. He's saying, you need to try to understand what spirit is coming at you. See, first, we mess up because we don't test the spirit. We just have a spiritual experience, but we don't question who is bringing the experience to us. Is it God? Is it Satan? We get so used to walking around trying to live a good life that as soon as we're attacked, we call God. But as soon as life goes back somewhat normal, we get comfortable again and just ride out and the devil is plotting his plan because the devil is never going to let you just live a good life. Life. You have to learn to discern. Don't cry, discern. <laughs> Don't sit there weak, discern. Don't sit there hopeless, say, I need to understand what this spirit is doing in my life. There is a great text. One, I don't have time because the sermon is great, uh, but there's one verse that will help you understand. Proverbs 14, 6 says, The mocker seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. A mocker, and, 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 and Spirit of God told me what that was when I was going through this. Mockery is when you say, Oh God, I love you. Oh God, I'll do anything you say. But then you sit there and let the enemy steal everything from you and beat you up. You sit there and just punk out every time the devil shows up. And you wonder what happened. Then, then you run to God like you're a child. Never growing up. God said, That's, you're making mockery out of my anointing by not trying to stand with some courage and take your ground. But he also told us discernment is more than just knowing between right and wrong. Discernment is when I can judge the moral direction of my choice. When I can look at it and say, no, there's too many pitfalls to go that way. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. There's some things you did when you first got saved, and maybe you tripped into them, maybe you didn't want to do them, but you know, you, you did it, 
and it costs you too much. And now, in your own mind, you tell yourself, I'm not doing that again because it costs too much. How? Because discernment is something you have to exercise. Here it is. It's tough. Every day. Did I tell you that following the spirit of Antichrist is easier than following the spirit of Christ? Because following the spirit of Christ takes work because our flesh does not want to do what God says. So our flesh can relate to the devil because he appeals to our fleshly nature. The devil is not bringing you something you don't want. He's bringing you something you need, you think you need, and something that he knows your flesh Need. Stay there with me. You have a need, some of you. Oh my God. You've got a spirit in your life so bad that you got to have at least one pity party a day. I got my day. One quarter. Got my pity. Had yours yet? I mean, you can't stay. You're waiting on uh, the, uh, the, the saying is, I'm waiting on the other shoe to drop. Instead of just hanging there with God, you're looking for a way to have failure because discernment must be exercised. Every day, the devil is relentless. Watch this. Solomon is our example. You know, Solomon, after David died, he went to God in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. He said, um, I need wisdom so I can govern your people, God. Give me a spirit of discernment. Look at the text. That's what he asked for. Solomon said, he had no sense when he came to God. I need discernment. So I can really govern your people. He got it. He got rich. He got famous. He tore down all the false gods. He, he was the wisest man that ever lived. But wisdom won't keep you if your character is not honest. If you have a character that likes to deceive people on the outside, but on the inside, you know you're not who you want to be. You're not really fooling anybody because all you're doing is getting beat up by the spirits that you are allowing in your life. Look what happened to Solomon. He has some wisdom in his sermon. The text says in the 11th chapter when he got older he loved many strange women. First verse of the 11th chapter. Solomon loved many foreign women. Got many foreign wives. When Solomon got those four wives, you know what he did? His heart, this text says, was turned toward the heart of his wives. Now watch this. Even though they were turned toward the heart of his wives, the reason the devil deceived him is because the text says he loved God, but his heart was turned. Don't miss that. Some of you are sitting here, you turn me off because you say, you can't be talking about me the way I love God. David loved God and felt Solomon was falling into the same tricks, letting the spirits steal what God had. As a matter of fact, to his shame, because he didn't exercise his discernment all through his life, it says he began to serve Astaroth, the god of the Sidonians, Moloch, the god of the Amorites. Kimosh, the god of the Moabites. He started serving. Then he had nerve to build places of worship for them. Solomon! That's why you see him in the preacher looking so sad. Because somewhere along the line, the spirit got control of his mind and his body. Look, listen to me, somebody. You can't just shout this off with a fake shout. You just can't grab a scripture and shake this off. You got to make up your mind. I'm going to test every spirit. That's the wrong spirit if it's taking me from God. Got to make up your mind which way you're going to go. Look what he said. So, so get the connection. Many, uh, test the spirits. See whether they're of God. Look what else it says. Because many false prophets have come into the world. Don't miss this. What it's saying is test the spirits because many false prophets are going into the world. Don't miss it. What does it mean? It's saying this. Spirits can control prophets, kings, and people. Watch the connection. Test the spirits. Why? Because there's many false prophets. All I'm saying is the spirit can turn you into a false prophet. And you won't even know. Because you, got, you didn't test it to find out. This discernment is so filled because your life could be filled with joy and the peace that God has but until you understand that you have to figure out which spirit is running you 
It's going to continue to try to run you. First Chronicles chapter 21. I just used Solomon. Let me give David as an example. You know, Jax, watch how the devil does. The Bible says in First Chronicles chapter 21, first verse, it says, And Satan rose up to put in David's heart to count the people of God. Be careful. You might not understand why that's so deadly. But what the devil does is he uses our human weaknesses of pride and, and, and jealousies and envy and anger and lust. He uses those spirits to control us. So this one was pride. He said, counting the people. Remember what, what pride got to do with counting the people? Because he wanted to count his mighty army. He had just won all those battles. He was prideful over his army. Here's the problem. Some of us, God can't give anything to because he knows as soon as he gives it to us, we start being prideful over something we never earned. The same way you got it, my God, you can lose it tomorrow. God said, I can't give this to someone who takes my glory. David, Joab, his general said, King, don't do this. God has been good to you. You don't have to count the people. David ignored him. But the verse said that God was angry with David. And he gave David three trials. What I like about God being angry is even when God is angry, we get the benefit of the doubt. What do I mean? Look what he told David. He said, David, because you went against me, because you disobeyed me, he said, now you can have three years of your enemies defeating you. You can have three, I mean, three years of famine, or you can have three months of your enemy defeating you, or you can have three days of my sword. He calls it the sword of the Lord. David said, I'd rather choose God. Smart David. No, I'd rather choose God because God, even in God's chastisement of us, he still loves us enough. But David was influenced by the wrong. David. Yep. Right here on the Psalms. Yep. Wrong spirit. You know, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphire in Acts chapter 5? The Bible said that all the people had got together and Ananias and Sapphire sold a piece of property for so much money. And they went to the prop. They didn't have to lie about it. They went to the apostle and said, I sold it for this much. The Bible said they kept back some. And the Bible said when he got before Peter, Peter looked at him. Ananias. I want you to see the third and fourth verse of that chapter. He said, Ananias, when you sold that property, it was yours. It was in your power to give us what you wanted to give us. And yet you had lied. But you don't understand. Here's what people didn't see behind the scenes. Peter knew that Ananias had been flirting with that wrong spirit. And he was trying to bring it into the church. So Peter said, you didn't just lie to man. You lied to God. Have we ever thought about the fact that when we lie, we can't fool God? He said, you lied. You just lied to man. You lied to God. To God. Okay, you fooled me. But you lied to God. Who's the one going to supply your needs? Who's going to be the one that supplies you, you know, give you what you need? Who's going to be the one to give you gas in your car? You, you, you have lied to God. That's, that wrong spirit has so deceived you to the Bible said he dropped dead. You know the story. His wife dropped dead. Why? Because they both lied. The wrong spirit will come along if you don't start distinguishing in your discernment which spirit it is. You're going to start following anybody and that will kill you because the devil twists the scriptures. He twists what's going on to make you justified. He tries to make you love what you're doing. What am I talking about? Um, there was a, an executive on, in New York. He had in his office, on his office walls, was a lining of all famous sketches. And he had one of the sketches was of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And he would come into his office in the morning and the picture was crooked. Now the tower was already leaning, but the picture was crooked. He couldn't figure it out. He would straighten the picture up. So he went home. Next night when he came in, the cleaning lady, when next morning he came in, the cleaning lady was still there. He looked at her and said, hey, do you know what's going on with this picture? I come in, I straighten it up, but it's crooked every morning. She said, oh, I did it. She said, I have to straighten it so the tower is straight. He said, no. That's not, watch this, how the picture was made. It wasn't made. The tower was made to lean. 
Just like that lady thought, I got to twist this picture. The devil twist your understanding of God's word until you are straightening up, following the wrong spirit, straightening up stuff that should be crooked and leaving crooked stuff that should be straight. Takes me to the second point. Not only must you discern the spirits, you must also learn to trust God. The text tells us when he talks about trusting God, hereby know we the spirit of God and the spirit of Antichrist. Any spirit that confess Jesus coming to flesh is the spirit of God. Any other spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. Look, in this text, he's saying not only must you discern and distinguish, you must learn to trust God's spirit and understand. Listen to what spirit you're listening to. If it's telling you to go against God, it is the wrong spirit. But I'm going to tell you how comfortable I get. I hope my wife don't get me for this. But right now, I don't think she'll do nothing while we live. Anyhow, my wife and I shacked up. And we shacked up because the world expected us to shack up. We weren't saved then. So we were shacking up like everybody else does. You heard, you heard, you heard what I was saying? You know, don't buy the car to you know try it out. You know what I mean? Kick a few tires. Yeah, you you heard it before. Uh, I don't want the cow till I try the milk. And so what happens is we shacked up. So what happens is you start having sex while you're shacking up. Not me and her. Oh, and, and I'm not calling her a cow. And and, and if I was, she's a pre cow. Anyway, what is this? You heard the other part. Why should I buy the cow when I can get the milk for free? And that's what normally what happens is people begin to stay together and live together and never ever really make a commitment because the devil takes us further than we want to go and there is no commitment and now your spirit is all confused because you won't trust what God said. I know marriage is hard but man I declare to you it is better to do things God's way than anybody else's way. Doing what God says is going to ultimately give you the right thing. You got to understand if you have been tricked, I don't know why God got me right here, this is not on my notes. If you have been tricked into thinking it's okay to be saved and walk around just having sex all you want, uh, I point you to the Bill Cosby effect. Sooner or later, something's going to come out. Matter of fact, when I was growing up, there was a song about a woman saying old school people that said, uh, just because he wants to make love doesn't mean he loves you. Not really. So we need to understand that we have to distinguish and understand how to trust God, look, Jesus did it. He made sure he knew what spirits were after him. How do I know? Matthew 16. Remember with Peter? When he said, uh, Who men say I am? And Peter gave that divine revelation, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. He said, Blessed art you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but the Spirit of God. The next verse, Jesus started talking about how he was going to die. This same Peter jumped up and said, No, Lord, that will never happen while I'm here. You know what Jesus said? Wrong spirit. Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things of God. Jesus told us to understand that that spirit will kill us. But we got to trust in God and follow God. Last thing I'll tell you about trust is this is a vigilant spirit. This is a, uh, you got to be on it. This is a, it'll help you through. It's the tough time that you got to really understand the spirit because David found out when he didn't trust God, look what happened to his life. Are y'all with me? David said it was a time he should have been for war, but he walked out and he saw Bathsheba bathing on the road. Can you imagine a naked Bathsheba? Now watch this. We don't know if she went out there because David was out there walking every night so we can't hold her harmless but somehow David saw her. Somebody asked me one time, I said, Pastor, what's wrong with pornography? What's the matter with pornography? Oh, hear me. Because once that vision comes into your heart and your mind, remember the Bible says, 
our eye gate, what we see goes directly into our heart. Once our heart is changed, that spirit can rob us of any kind of control. Watch me. There's people that say, I'm not hooked on pornography, but they look at it every night. Watch this. There was a, a couple in our church years ago. She came to me and said, I'm getting a divorce. I said, why? So we're getting put out of our house. I said, what happened? We keep getting all these notices. He works and I works. She said, I found this. <laughs> Slapped it down on my desk. It was a $3,000 a month he had been spending on one of those talk to the person pornography sites. At the expense of a child. When I asked this man what happened, he could not do it. Can I take you through? I'm very close. I want you to stay with me. I'll take you through how spirits talk to you. Let's look at David so we can figure it out. Watch what happened. So David sees Bathsheba. All of a sudden the spirit says, who is she? David said, hmm, who is she? And then all of a sudden, he said, you're the king. You can have who you want. Find out who she is. So David sent one of his men to find out who she is. I believe the man came back and said, uh, she is the wife of Uriah, but he's off in battle. The spirit said, He's off in battle. We can have her. You're the king. No won't be anything. Just invite her over. So he invited Bathsheba over. Now, let's go with the spirit telling Bathsheba. Spirit telling Bathsheba, uh, ooh, ooh, look at the king. Ain't he fine? And when he found Bathsheba, he found himself. She said, yes, and pre know David and Bathsheba sitting in the bed, eating grapes, lazy potato chips, diet Pepsi, Sitting around there talking about how they love each other. And then Bathsheba said, I'm pregnant. David said what everybody said. It ain't mine. And then, watch how the devil worked. I gotta go quickly. The devil said, All right, we gotta fix this. Call your ride back. Get him drunk. Devil talking. David followed that spirit. Didn't work. Get him drunk again. Didn't work. David, kill him. David, kill him. Sitting on the front line. But look at this. David didn't even know what he did. Remember, it was Nathan, the, the prophet who came to David and said, there was a man that had a lot of sheep and one man had one sheep, but the man with a lot of sheep took the one sheep. David said, who is that man? He said, David, it's you. David was so deceived that he didn't even know he was following the wrong spirit. Watch this, guys. You can be so deceived Deceived if you don't trust God on every angle. You just can't pick and choose when you don't trust God. There was a uh, baker who thought the farmer who was bringing him his butter was cheating him. So sure enough, he took three or four days to examine and weigh his butter, and it was off. He went and confronted that farmer, called the authorities, had him locked up. When they got to court and the farmer got on the stand, he said, uh, prosecutor said, well, why did you cheat him? He said, well, I didn't cheat him. I don't have a scale. He said, how do you weigh the butter? He said, well, I always weigh it by taking a loaf, a one pound loaf of the baker's bread, and I just weigh it by weighing what he calls a pound. The baker looked up. He was cheating himself, but he accused someone else because you never can see the wrong spirit in yourself. The man was using his weight. That's what the spirit does. Let's close. Gives us, ye are of God, little children. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Trust that spirit. All that's saying is if God said it, I believe it. If God said it, Act out what you believe. Give me two minutes. Act out what you believe. Because the last thing is, the last verse of this text says, they are of the world. Verse 5. Therefore speak they of the world. We are of God. And he knows God hears us. That is not, uh, for God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Because we know who we are. Listen, let's wrap this up. Test the spirits. 
Discern the things. Trust God. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Meaning, the greater spirit, no matter what spirit's trying to get you, you have the ability. Me and Marcia didn't when we were shacking up, but you have the ability as a believer to trust and discern that greater spirit. And then finally, you need to understand that you have to tackle that spirit. Look what he said. They are the world. Therefore, they speak of the world. I'm a God. I'm going to tackle every spirit that comes in my life and make sure that it's of God. I know. My attitude is I know in whom I believe. John said, try that spirit. Come on, don't be taken captive by the wrong spirit in 2021. Don't sit there whining and crying, wondering what's going on. Check that stuff off. Remember, the greater one is in you. You're of God. I know who I am. Can I tell you the story of Paganini as we close? Paganini was this great violinist. The hall was packed. He was playing on his violin, and he was captivating the audience. All of a sudden, one string popped. Paganini kept playing. They cheered. He got into another part. And the second string popped. Paganini kept playing. Did not stop. Kept playing, of course you saw. The third string popped. But he made it to the end of the number. Everybody stood, gave him a round of applause. And he hollered out, Paganini will play an encore with one string. And he sat and played an encore with one string. Tears coming down people's eyes. What happened? Paganini said, I know who I am. I won't let the circumstances of a string break you. Stop me. My attitude is, I am the great Paganini. My brothers and sisters, you are the great child of God. Don't Leave this message without saying, I'm going to go home and I'm going to test every spirit. I'm going to trust God because he's greater. And I'm going to tackle because I know who I am. God bless you. This Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day. If you don't know the Lord, let me lead you. In his quick prayer, say this. Say, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I need your strength. Come into my heart. I give my life to you. Because I believe it. Say this. I am saved. And say this. Jesus is Lord. I always tell people. Jesus is Lord. Mean I know what spirit I believe. If you want to give to our ministry. I just want to say as I close it. Thank you for tuning in. We, we think it's a pleasure to have you. If this ministry has been blessing you in any way. Please give. You can go online and give to Givelify. You can get to our PayPal. Go to our website, um, Shiloh Baptist Churches. www.shiloh Baptist Churches. This pastor doesn't say tune in. Stay with, stay with us. Have someone like, join, go to our YouTube channel. Have a great day. Test the spirits. Make sure. Hey, you see something wrong. Say that's the wrong spirit. And it won't get me. God bless you. I was down, but with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. What he did for me